to the Defence Strategic Review, and I'm joined by uh, a veteran of the Army of nearly uh, 30 years, uh, served in East Timor himself. He's a professor of international security at ANU. John Blacksland, our friend, uh, regular on this program. Thanks for joining us this Anzac Day. Good to be with you, Kieran. This, you've had a bit of time to digest the Defence mm. Strategic Review now. Mm. How does it stack up in your view? So it, uh, there is a consistency with previous white papers. There is a fairly coherent articulation of the security challenges we face. They're broader than they were before. It's not just about military threats. There's a, a, a cyber dimension. There's a space dimension. And, of course, the, uh, the challenges we face from the exponential growth of China's military capabilities has generated a desire to be able to put up something that could possibly deter a, any act of aggression in Australia's neighbourhood or against Australia specifically. And that's led to thinking about long range precision strike because so far Australia's got nothing in that field. We've, we've seen how very vulnerable. We've seen how effective the missiles have been in, in Ukraine right Absolutely, now. Absolutely. Yeah. It's also depleted a lot of a, a lot of stock with that war. Where where do we get these missiles from and can we build the sovereign capability to mm make them ourselves. Yeah, so we get them from countries like Norway, Kongsberg uh, and from the United States, largely Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, these kind of companies manufacture these. What we're looking to is a guided weapons explosive ordnance capability in Australia that gets licensed manufacture from these other international companies to enable us to get the stocks. Used to, we used to think of the United States as the arsenal of, of democracy. The United States is now stretched, meeting its own requirements, certainly the requirements requirements of allies and, of course, the requirements of Ukraine. So we, what we realise is that stocks are low and when there's a crisis, everybody's calling for this stuff. We actually need to be more resilient. We need more supplies. And there is a plan to go and basically have local manufacture to make that happen. But it How is still some time it, away. So what, what's some time? Are we talking still several years away? Well, yeah, unfortunately... It sounds like the government wants to move on at ASAP, at least with the missiles. Yeah, no, they do. Uh, there is, an, unfortunately, unfortunately, a real inertia in the system. There's, uh, you know, there's bureaucratic wheels that spin. There's a commitment by the government to cut through it. But, you know, even this review has kind of put things on, on hibernation while the review was undertaken. And even then, you know, projects that could have just been rolled through have, have actually been cancelled and others have been wound back. So it speaks to a, a, a political problem. Um, the government has articulated very compellingly, in my view, the case, um, but it's, it's got a political problem arising from, I think, a misunderstanding of AUKUS. I think people don't quite get what AUKUS was about and why it was done. And the fact that it was a Scott Morrison, Boris Johnson deal seemed like it was something that was more political than substantive. And I think what people need to understand is, OK, there was the politics to it, but it coincided with a, a genuine technological and strategic challenge. And that is that Australia's submarines, with the advent of persistent polar orbit satellites that operate, largely Chinese-operated satellites, they can monitor our, our uh, submarines' actions combined with artificial intelligence, throwing drones in the mix, and basically as soon as an Australian submarine surfaces to recharge its batteries, it sends out a wake that is detectable from these satellites. So they'd be sitting ducks? They're sitting ducks. This is the problem. So all this talk and Keating-esque remark about 40 or 50 diesel submarines, not the, not the, not the nuclear proportion ones, is actually... It's, it's actually it's it's worse than fanciful. It's yeah. it's dangerous. But the but, problem but is the, the, the government nuclear been, subs and AUKUS fits it, it fits well, the, in with this. It is. It's in there. But the government's been reluctant to really articulate compellingly how important this is. And I understand why. They don't want to be labelled like, you know, beating the drums of war. They don't want that. Um, they're also not wanting to actually spend more than the previous government committed to. And there's a recognition that they probably will have to eventually, but it's not mapped out there. And they've got this pressure because of, you know, they're basically saying, look, we're not going to be doing a lot more with health, welfare, education. So if we're not going to do it for, you know, what is usually a labour heartland kind of issues, why would we do it for 
uh, the military and for defence. That's not a comfort zone for some, other than, you know, the former uh, Defence Minister and, and Labor Party leader, Kim Beasley, who's really uh, front-footed about this and completely gets it. He gets the, 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 yeah. the strategic implications but and those the technological subs, dimensions. But that, the, but that whole strategy, the, the AUKUS strategy, yeah. is in tune with... Yeah, no, it, it is, the, and it's a leading pillar. It's a leading pillar of it. But the problem is that what we've done, because of the kind of timidity about expenditure, we've put AUKUS inside the, the current uh, uh, framework for expenditure. So that means that everything else in defence is getting squeezed. Um, and so a lot of things are being wound back, programs are being cancelled, operational tempo is being constrained, uh, training resources are being cut back, all to accommodate... AUKUS within the existing envelope rather than expanding it. Now, remember, the Defence Minister talked about 0.15% of GDP that the AUKUS deal would cost through 256 to $268 billion submarines over 30 years. People gasped when they heard that figure, but we didn't put it in context. This is, I think, what would have been helpful. If we think about health, welfare and education over the same period, nine trillion dollars. I mean, we're serious, serious amounts of money. So, and the defence would have been 1.6 trillion, OK? So, if over 30 years, everything looks like an enormous amount of money, OK? Yeah. But the AUKUS amount for the submarines is actually, yes, it's a lot of money. It's on one thing, it's never been done on that scale before. But we've never faced the challenges we face today. No. We've never faced the great power contestational challenge, the technological challenge of our equipments being essentially obsolescent, of us not having the range, not having the kit, while also facing other challenges in the Pacific, particularly environmental concerns and governance concerns that require DFAT being muscled up, our aid and development program and other outreach as well.